Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the October membership meeting of the Benton County Master Gardeners Association. Uh, this is our annual meeting, so we do have some business to attend to. Um, we will, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, that's great, Nancy. <laughs> Um, so the business portion of the meeting will come at uh, the end tonight as a courtesy to our guest speaker. We will allow him to go first and then escape. Um, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Jay Scheidt. He received his PhD in plant pathology from the University of Wisconsin at Madison in 1985. Since 1988, he's been a professor at Oregon State as an extension plant pathology specialist. His principal duties are to lead a statewide extension program related to the diagnosis and management of diseases of all fruit, nut, and ornamental and nursery crops. We're best acquainted with him as Master Gardeners, I think, because he is co-editor of the Pacific Northwest Plant Disease Management Handbook. Now, I wrote a rather vanilla introduction to the talk tonight and asked Jay if he'd like to provide his own version. And he came back with something that tops whatever I could written. Jay says, if COVID, smoke, and fire have not been enough for you, this pre-Halloween talk might do the trick. Your treat will be understanding the interesting world of plant viruses, what they are, how do they get around, what symptoms do they cause on infected plants? You might just find you want some of them, really. So with that, Jay, welcome. We're looking forward to your talk. Ah, good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be with you tonight for this lovely evening tonight. Uh, usually I talk about mummy berry and ghost plant, but tonight, yes, very vicious. Plant viruses is what we'll be talking about tonight. Okay, let's see if we can share the screen and get some more things going on here. Let's see where we are with all of this. Well, that's not the one I wanted to start with, so that's all right. Let's go up here, right to that one. Yes, thank you for the introduction, very good. Uh, hopefully everybody can see the screen and hear me just fine. Uh, my name is uh, Count I mean, Dr. Jay Scheidt, uh, extension plant pathologist for Oregon State University, cover a lot of different crops here. Uh, this is that book that uh, Alan just mentioned, the Plant Disease Management Handbook. I do that with my counterpart, uh, Dr. Cindy Yocum. And as you might not, as you might notice, there is a plant virus on the cover of the book this year. And we'll be talking about that in just a little while. Uh, oh, you're probably more familiar with the website here where we have lots of information. In fact, all the plant diseases, all the viruses that we will be talking about uh, will, be in, uh, will be, you can find all the information there uh, at that website. Oh yeah, smoke, <laughs> you remember the smoke? That was nasty, yes, yeah, just a few items about that. There were a few plant. most plants have no problem with the smoke, people do, of course. Uh, but we did find that there was some defoliation of a couple of sarcococca uh, cultivars, not the, you, the common one that's around quite a bit, but Confusa and Ruscifolia seem to have uh, dropping their green leaves during that smoke event. Otherwise, most plants came through it just fine. In fact, I expect these to do uh, fine as well. Most of the time I'm talking about not uh, abiotic diseases, but infectious diseases like fungi, bacteria, of course, viruses, which is our topic tonight. And of course, parasitic seed plants as well. Uh, most plant diseases are caused by fungi. In fact, the one I want you to kind of remember is boxwood blight. It's a new one that's around. It's a, uh, it has this leaf spotting and defoliation are the hallmarks of that. In fact, I'm gonna see if I can find uh, somewhere on here, there should be uh, da, 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 not a remote control. Well, I'm not seeing it right away. Uh, there should be a, a, can you see my mouse as it goes around on the screen? So there's leaf spots that you see here. 
the foliation that you see there. Alan, can you see those? Uh, I, I see your mouse, yes. Very good. I'll use that mouse. There's usually a And excuse me for just a second, Jay. Um, I forgot to announce at the beginning that uh, your preference is to answer questions at the end of the talk. So if people will enter their questions into the chat as they go, then uh, you'll follow up at the end. At the end, we'll go through them quite a bit. Yes, no problem with that at all. Boxwood blight is a major problem. Uh, well, it's, it's ravaged Europe. Uh, the East Coast has had pictures that have come across uh, that look very similar. I don't know why it's not uh, advancing here at the moment, but we'll get it to advance. Probably have to have my mouse over a particular spot. Okay, lovely. It doesn't want to do that. It has actually frozen up, which is not good. Uh, let's try a few other things here. Ah, there we go. These are the sorts of pictures that we were seeing in Europe and on the East Coast. But this particular disease, this one ought to scare you because uh, this was taken last year in a backyard in Salem, Oregon. That's right. This is one to keep an eye out for boxwood blight. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. We're going to talk about viruses. Yes, lots of plant viruses. Abutilon. Anybody have abutilon? This variegated plant, the variegation is actually due to a virus. If we got rid of the virus out of this plant, why you would just have nice dark green leaves. All this mosaic of uh, light green and dark green or light yellow, uh, all of those colors that you're seeing there on these butylon plants, that's due to a virus. In fact, here is a chameleon. Chameleon also has this color break that you see here. It's color breaking. Oh, this brown down here, that's a fungal disease. No worry about that. The color break that you see on this camellia and the yellowing on the leaves here are due to a variegated virus that's in the camellia plant. So maybe you want those. Most of the time, no, we don't want viruses. They're going to do things like this to your zucchini. Zucchini yellows mosaic virus. And yeah, nobody wants their zucchini looking like that up on top. Or cucumber mosaic virus on your tomatoes you're not going to get many tomatoes on that. So yes, viruses on plants can be extremely devastating. We're talking about really small things. We were just talking about a fungus. A fungus is a multicellular creature here. Uh, it's about the size of a plant cell. The viruses we're talking about, much, much smaller. In fact, they're so small, they're more like particles. They're infectious molecules, if you want to think of them that way. It's hard to get an idea of how big things are or how small these things are. And so I have this little video here. You can kind of look at it here. Uh, most people, well, you might not know how big an elephant is. That's kind of a little hard. Humans or sunflower plant, you know how big those are. Uh, and we're going, to go, we're going to go down, down as far as we can go here to look at plant viruses. Uh, a basketball or a, a ruler, you can know how big those are, a teapot. No problem there. Uh, how about an egg? Just a, a chicken egg or a penny. Not too many people are using change anymore, but I think most of the people here probably recognize what a, how big a penny might be. Or a sunflower seed. Yes, yeah, sunflower seeds, very small. Uh, but we're, we need to get smaller yet. Oh, an ant. You've seen ants running around the garden. That's right, but we got to go way smaller than that if we want to see a virus. Uh, you, the thickness of a piece of paper, thickness of your human hair, smaller than that yet. In fact, we got to go so small that we cannot see them with the naked eye. You've got to get smaller yet. In fact, uh, let's see, what are we coming up to now? Oh, chloroplast, smaller than a chloroplast that you would find in a plant cell. Uh, bacteria, chromosomes, smaller yet than that. Oh, here they're coming. Some of the largest viruses we know about, uh, they're coming up, they're, they're a little bit smaller than that E. coli and that, or that X chromosome. Here's the, the largest viruses, they're coming up here. And then, oh, they're coming into focus now, HIV and hepatitis B virus, that's about the size of the viruses we're talking about. In fact, COVID-19 is about that same size. Oh, DNA, nope, nope, sorry. We're getting a little too small here, but we're almost at that level, okay? Here is a picture, it's an electron micrograph of tobacco mosaic virus. Yeah, it's just these little rod things that you're seeing here, these long rods. Some of them are long, some of them are a little bit short. 
that's all tobacco mosaic virus is. There's, there's really nothing more to it. Uh, it's, it's very simple. It's just coiled RNA. Yeah, I said that right. RNA. It has no DNA. You've probably been told DNA is the stuff of life. It's in people, it's in plants, it's in everything that's alive. Yeah, it's not part of these viruses. These are RNA viruses. Hey, COVID-19, you remember that one? Yeah, that's also an RNA virus. In this case, tobacco mosaic virus is just this single strand of coiled RNA and these protein subunits. That's all it is. Each one of these little red knobs that you see there, we call those a base, okay? And tobacco mosaic virus has 6,000 of these bases or six kilo bases, or in other words, we'll shorten it, just say six KB. That's really all uh, 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 these RNA viruses are. This sort of short circuit, the thing, DNA is, translate is uh, transferred into coded into RNA and RNA is coded into proteins. These things sort of short circuit that and are just plain RNA to begin with. Uh, members of the Solanaceae, you know the Solanaceae? Tobacco? What else is in the Solanaceae? Oh yeah, tomato, potato, things like that in the Solanaceae are susceptible to tobacco mosaic virus. Here's the virus here. Now you gotta get the virus from one plant, the diseased plant over to the healthy plant. There's lots of different ways to do that. You can do it by touch, that works. Or you can have uh, insects do it as well. We'll talk more about transmission of viruses uh, after a little while. And we'll also talk a little bit about the environment. Sometimes it takes a certain environment to see the symptoms of a particular virus on a plant. Here's symptoms of tobacco mosaic virus. And just so you don't fall asleep on me, here's a little song for you. are going to be so mad if they were late coming to this event. Okay, <laughs> so that's a little bit about tobacco mosaic virus. Yeah, 
most of these viruses, in fact, the majority of plant viruses are moved around by insects. They can be aphids, they can be leafhoppers, they can be white flies. Lots of different things can move viruses from an infected plant to a healthy plant. The aphids are kind of interesting. Of course, they have that nice stylet here where they poke into the plant, start sucking out the contents. They poke into a virus infected plant. Why they can get some of the virus particles on that stylet. And as soon as they move over to a healthy plant, they can move the virus to that healthy plant. And now it has the virus. Not all viruses are done that way. TMV will do that, but many other viruses will take some time before they can be transmitted. The, the aphid will stick its uh, uh, stylet in there. And then the virus actually has to, you know, these plant viruses, they don't infect people like us. They just infect plants, but some of them sort of infect these insects. Some of them will get into the aphid here and it will actually circulate. It has to actually circulate through the gut, through its, uh, its circulatory system, if it had one, uh, all the way to its salivary glands. And then if it gets into its salivary glands, now it can be injected into the plant. We call that one uh, circulative uh, viruses. Uh, it will take days or uh, weeks, maybe even a month before the virus before the aphid can transmit the, the virus from the infected plant to the healthy plant. Uh, there are lots of variations of that. I'll be talking about this all night long. If I did, we're not going to do that. Uh, lots of interesting things uh, with uh, viruses through that. Oh, one more thing about the viruses. It will change. In some cases, they can change the behavior of the insect. So an aphid that has the virus, they're very attracted to healthy green plants. They love, they love that. But if they don't have the virus, aphids are attracted to actually a, a virus infected plant, something that looks weak, something yellowed. They're actually attracted to that. So having the virus or not having the virus can change its behavior uh, overall. Oh, uh, nematodes can also transmit viruses. Uh, they have this little mouth part up here called a stylet. They're, these are large, uh, well, they're large compared to the virus. Uh, they have their small roundworms uh, is what they are. Here's one, the one that transmits viruses. They call this one the Dagger nematode. Great name for a nematode, huh, for tonight? A dagger nematode. Here's a dagger nematode here. He's on a root. You can kind of see it all the way down here. And then right here, uh, where my uh, pointer is, hopefully you can see that, is its stylet. And I mean, we're going to show you a little video clip where it's kind of working its way into that plant root. And if it's feeding on a virus infected root, then it goes over to a healthy root and starts feeding on that. It can move the virus over to that healthy plant. Uh, there's, enough, there's lots of different ways viruses can move around. In this particular example, the virus, well, it doesn't really need an insect at all. In this case, the virus can actually just move from plant to plant, but it has to have a bridge. This is the best uh, example I could find. Usually if we've uh, got a plant here, maybe we have a, a cherry orchard where we've taken down a, a cherry tree because it's been infected by a virus. The virus can actually move through the roots and then for prunus in particular, will root graft together underneath there. You actually planted two different trees, but they grew together and now the roots are grafted together such that now if a virus gets into this plant, it can actually move through those root grafts and into what was a healthy tree. Now it's got the virus as well. And so that's something we need to watch out for. Oh, let's talk about blueberry scorch virus. This virus, you might see this one around here uh, in your backyards. This particular virus is pollen borne. It's actually infects, if you will, the pollen and can move from plant to plant via pollen. And of course, what's moving the pollen around? Yeah, it's uh, the bees. The bees aren't really moving the virus. They're just moving the pollen as they visit from one flower to another flower in this case and can transmit this particular blueberry scorch. Or, excuse me, I, I used the wrong term there, blueberry shock 
virus. A blueberry shock virus is shown here in this picture. This plant that looks like it's almost dead has shock. Now, if it had scorch, blueberry scorch virus, yes, it would be dead because of that virus. But for blueberry shock virus, they'll actually recover as time goes on. And I want to show you that in a few uh, pictures here. What I've done is I've taken pictures here uh, successively through the growing season. The plant up here in the upper left hand corner, this is the one with the shock virus. It's showing you the shock symptoms. These other three blueberry plants that are flowering don't have the shock symptoms. They might have the shock virus in them, but they don't have the shock symptoms that you're seeing now. So I'm going to Press the button now, and we're going to see successive pictures as it goes through the growing season. You can see that upper left plant just doesn't look good at all. It gets worse and worse until finally it actually starts refoliating. It starts getting some new shoots. New leaves are coming out while the other plants have gone ahead and produced yield, produced some fruit because their flowers weren't blighted away by this particular virus. Uh, they have a yield on them where those other plant up here that had the blueberry shock symptoms uh, does not have any yield because of this particular virus. Now, because it's recovered, next year it will flower and it will produce fruit. So it will recover almost to 100% of where it was before, but it will always have the virus and all the pollen coming from that plant is infectious to other plants that are around it. Now my blueberry planting across the river there did get this shock virus in there and I want to show you how it moved through that particular planting. So in about 2003, nothing was there, but in 2004, one plant came down with this virus. The next year, 2005, we found three plants that had this particular virus sort of scattered all around. And then it just grows from there, gets worse and worse as time goes on. I'm going to stop it here at 2007 uh, because I wanted the red dots or the red, what are supposed to represent plants, blueberry plants, uh, they have the shock symptoms. The white ones, well, the white is showing that maybe only one branch has those symptoms or maybe two branches, but not the entire bush. Later uh, next year, the entire bush may have that particular uh, symptom uh, with these uh, white ones here. The light green ones have not been infected yet, but the dark green ones that you see here, those have recovered and will start produce, uh, producing yield like they had before. The problem, of course, is that everything that's red is not producing anything. And so we have to su suffer through this uh, heavy period here, here in 2008, almost the whole field looks like it's going down, but then slowly it will recover as all the plants become infected by this particular virus. And now uh, life gets back to normal here in 2012, where we have very little virus symptoms out there, even though the whole planting has the virus in it. Here's again, another picture of a blueberry plant with blueberry shock virus. Once it has gone through those shock reactions, you can see this necrosis, what well, looks like necrosis, not actually necrotic, it's actually discolored. So it has this sort of a brownish reddish discoloration here on these lower leaves. But you'll notice the upper leaves, the ones up through here, they look just fine. These symptoms down here, well, for lack of a better term, I call them aftershocks. <laughs> uh, but those are the sort of symptoms you would see. The plant still has the virus in it. But then as the temperature gets warmer and warmer as the season goes on during the summer, we won't see the symptoms of that particular virus. Here's another picture here showing you, yes, all of these older leaves have, have the aftershock symptoms, but all the newer leaves don't seem to have that because the environment is not conducive for symptom development. Probably the best way to move a virus from plant to plant is everybody here. All of mankind does a really excellent job of grafting plants together and moving these viruses around. Cherry orchards are probably the worst. I tell you, those cherry growers, they want to save a little money. They don't want to buy that nice virus certified plant. They'll go down. This particular example, this is necrotic rusty model virus. The orchardist told me he went down to his neighbor's uh, orchard. His neighbor's orchard looked beautiful. 
So he got his scion wood from that, put it onto his rootstocks, and that was his biggest mistake because that great looking orchard had, it was carrying a virus he didn't know about. And when he transplanted those or grafted those onto the rootstock, the whole thing went down. He was very sorry that that's what he did. He lost a lot of money doing that. So yes, man is a very good uh, mover of plant viruses from one place to another. Which kind of brings me to symptoms and signs of plant viruses. Let's talk about that for a moment because most of the time we see symptoms of plant viruses. That's something that the host plant is doing. That's all we've shown you so far. You're really not going to see signs of a plant virus. Signs the structure that's uh, producing that. Remember, they're really, really small. But if you get a microscope out, if you know what you're doing, you stain it the right way, you can actually see these structures within the plant cells. Sometimes they're in pinwheels or scrolls or bars. There's so much virus that the plant cells have been producing that they actually crystallize out. And we can begin to see these kinds of structures uh, in the plant cells themselves. But that's not something that uh, you're going to see. What you're going to see is something more like this. Here's another one that maybe you might want in your tulips. Tulip breaking virus. The color break that you see in these two lower tulips, yes, that's due to this tulip breaking virus. It should be a nice red color like you see up on top here. People thought this was the cat's meow. Back in the 1600s, why everybody wanted those tulips they didn't survive very well. And so they were a short supply, you know, short supply, large demand. Yeah, their prices went sky high. One tulip bulb, just one tulip bulb was as much as a house. That's how much they were going for. The first stock market was actually built around tulips. These tulip uh, breaking virus, they didn't know about viruses at the time. They just knew that these were very pretty uh, virus, uh, tulips and uh, a stock market developed around that. And so that they were taking futures on it. Oh yeah, just like any stock market. Yeah, it tanked. People lost all kinds of money because they were just going crazy for it. You can Google tulip mania. That's what they called it, tulip mania. Look it up. It's all about a plant virus that, yeah, I don't think you really want this one. Hey, you know, it's an important virus because the US government doesn't issue stamps for just anything. <laughs> There you go. You've probably seen this one in your backyard, right? Rose mosaic virus. I think I, I can't see you, but I know there's lots of people nodding their head. Yeah, I've seen that out there. I wanted to show you, this is a mosaic, areas of light green and dark green or light yellow, or sometimes it might almost look white with the lack of uh, any pigment uh, altogether. I wanted to show you this because these four leaves are all from the exact same plant. So it's not a regular mosaic like you might get with some variegation or some genetic uh, type abnormality. This is a infection by a virus. And uh, uh, I, I know a lot of you probably have this in your backyard. You probably love those plants. Uh, they may not be declining a, as fast as you might think. Here's another one. When you see these symptoms, you can think virus. Anybody got this honeysuckle? Got it in my backyard. Notice the veins, the veins are yellow or the veins are sort of whitish. If you see white veins or yellow veins, they can think virus right away. It's not yellow between the veins. If it's yellow between the veins, now we're thinking maybe a, a, night, a, a, a deficiency of some sort, okay? But if it's the veins themselves are colored, then you can think virus. And here we have uh, this uh, lilac is showing you line patterns. Line patterns are a very common uh, symptom that you get with plant viruses and ring spots, lots of ring spots that you see on this particular uh, lilac leaf. Those are also very common. They're not necrotic, they're not sunken. It's just a discoloration that you see in the leaf itself. And some people might like that, I don't know. Uh, a lot of people don't. I'd rather not see plant viruses uh, in my uh, plants. Here's an interesting one here. You see the target board pattern? There's nothing else going to give you that but a virus. All these different leaves here on these mountain laurels have this virus in them. You sort of see that target board pattern on almost all of these different leaves and that plant's not looking too healthy, is it? Yeah, we don't want that one. <laughs> um, kissing cousins to viruses. They're not viruses. 
They're actually called phytoplasmas, which is kind of like a, a, a bacteria, if you will, uh, ester yellows. Uh, but I wanted to show you the symptom because there's, they, they, for all intents and purposes, they, they act like viruses. And so you get uh, flower parts that turn into what look like leaf parts. It should look like a flower all the way through here, but now uh, parts of them have become more leaf-like. And so floidy is the term that we use uh, for that one. I just thought I'd throw that one in there because it's a, a common thing uh, to sort of lump these together on there. So here I'm walking around, walking my dog in the neighborhoods because of COVID-19, uh, we're walking the dog all the time now. And I ran across this cherry, this flowering cherry in the neighborhood and asked myself, well, is this a virus or not? Uh, and and my uh, eye sees mostly virus. You can sort of see there's a leaf down in the lower right corner that is showing you a line pattern. Some of you might have uh, people uh, blocking that. In the middle, you'll see the yellow veins, uh, and then toward the middle and then a bit to the left, then these leaves are showing you leaf spot or leaf or ring spots on this particular plant. So I don't know what virus it is, but I can tell you that that's probably a plant virus just based on uh, the symptoms that I see there. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about other symptoms that you see, but I'm gonna do that in context of a program that we had a graduate student who worked on cherry, if I would do it a survey of cherry viruses through the state. Most of those uh, cherry viruses are, uh, most of the cherries are grown here in the Dalles or the mid Columbia area. Uh, we found lots of them over there. There are dozens of different viruses, oh my gosh, that go on to uh, prunus. It's just crazy how many there are. And these virologists, they use uh, acronyms for all of these things. And by the time you start trying to get into it, try to understand this stuff, you, uh, it just becomes more like uh, alphabet soup here. Yeah, X disease we were looking for and prunus, necrotic ring spot virus and cherry leaf roll virus. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, so we're trying to figure out how could we, how could we get it down to a point where we could uh, just talk about a few things and get growers to just worry about the, the important stuff. And we came up with this action rating because you know, these ring spots and line patterns for cherries, not necessarily for other plants, but for cherries, they do not really represent viruses that you really needed to take action on. They're there, they don't have to worry about it. Let's, let's worry about the things that, that do this, that kill trees. Yeah, you, wanna, you don't want a virus that's gonna kill your tree. You, you certainly don't want it to lower your yields and there are viruses that will make the fruit taste bad. You don't want those either, okay? Uh, and so we put this action rating together to try to break it down into about, oh, six different things growers could worry about. Uh, that didn't work so well. We could get it actually even down lower than that if we introduced the spread, how quickly they spread from one thing to another. But it turned out three symptoms would give us what we needed to worry about. Growers needed to take action if they saw any of these three symptoms. Enations, I'll talk about that in a moment, rosetting, or little cherry. Three different problems that they could look for. Enations, what's an enation? And the nation is the United States now that it's COVID, right? We're all connected to the internet and we're an e-nation. No, okay, it's, uh, yeah, I didn't know there was a group called the e-nations, right? I, no, all right, an e-nation, what's an e-nation? It's in growth on the underside of the leaf. If you look on the underside of this leaf, you'll see dark green growths on there. They're actually kind of like galls, if you will. Kind of looks like the top of the leaf coming out the bottom of the leaf. So here they're very subtle. They're along the main vein or the major veins here, or here's another one with some larger ones. It looks like a magic hand went through the bottom of the leaf, grabbed the top of the leaf and pulled it out the bottom of the leaf. It's just very strange looking things. Here's <laughs> this one's got so many enations all up and down it here. It's really rough kind of like a cat's tongue or like a file. In fact, they call this cherry rasp leaf because of it's like a rasp file. It's so rough on there. So those are enations. And there's lots of viruses that get uh, these enations. So one symptom, and we don't have to talk about all the different viruses. The growers know they have something they need to take action on. 
rosetting. Rosetting's another one. Rosetting's not too hard if you actually see a tree with it. Uh, here's a tree that has a normal branch on it here, and then all of this in the middle here is what we're talking about rosetting. If you took one of these normal branches here and you telescoped it in, so you had really short inner nodes, but the same kinds of leaves, they're all tufted together in a little rosette in there. And so that's what we call rosetting. And there's several different viruses will cause this particular symptom. And if you turn those leaves over, as it turns out, some of them will have, yes, enations on them right down here. And yeah, that's a virus for sure. There's several different ones that cause viruses that cause enation or rosetting on there. We have to be a little bit careful with this one because boron deficiency will cause some rosetting uh, to occur as well. So hopefully we have some other symptoms to go with uh, if you just have rosetting. As it turns out, a new virus that we didn't know was here in Oregon, cherry leaf roll virus. We found that in 2016 on this tree. This tree was declining rapidly. You see lots of dead limbs up here. Here's a one that died recently. There was some rosetting on it as well. It was not doing very well at all. And we wanted to know, well, okay, well, how fast did this disease hit this block? It was right next to a road. Uh, and so we invented a time machine and we went back in time. To, no, okay, we didn't invent time. We got onto Google Earth. Google Earth is kind of like a time machine. You can actually have historic views of what happened in the past. And if you go back to 2014, or excuse me, 2012, here that uh, declining tree here in 2016, it looks just fine here in 2012. In fact, the tree right next to it, tree A in 2012 looked fine. Now it's just a dead stump here in 2016. Four years declines and it's killing these trees. So yeah, nasty virus that we need to take action on. Okay, last symptom to talk about is little cherry. Little cherry is harder to talk about. I have, the names are <laughs> kind of weird. We're not talking about small cherries. Small cherries are okay. I mean, they taste good. They have good flavor, good sugar development. Uh, they're just small. And if you've got a market for larger cherries, you know, cherries that are, uh, you know, these cherries have probably more pit than they have uh, cherry. No, okay. So these things were harvested, but the market went south on them. They couldn't sell these smaller than normal cherries. And so here they're dumping them into a dump truck and it is literally going to the dump because there's no market for it. That's small cherries. Little cherries caused by a virus you can see on this branch here, you'll notice some look like they've ripened and others haven't ripened. And that's what this virus does is they don't ripen at all. In fact, the, these guys that don't have these little cherries, these fruit that aren't coloring, they'll never color, they'll just fall off the tree. The ones that look like they've ripened, if you taste them, no sugar development, no flavor development, Ugh, they're terrible. So what do the growers do? They don't even harvest these trees, they just skip them all together. So if they see little cherry symptoms, yeah, it's a virus that they need to worry about or uh, phytoplasma as we talked about earlier, high action ratings for these particular viruses. Yeah, so we've been going over symptoms of these various viruses. Yeah, you don't want ones that are going to kill trees. <laughs> oh, I tell you, cherry growers are an interesting lot. Hope springs eternal with these guys. They thought this tree would come back. Mm, no, they need to get rid of the whole tree. So those are the symptoms to worry about in that. So what do we do with about viruses? Oh my gosh, we got a plant virus. Sorry, there's not a lot you can do with it, except get rid of it. Yeah, rogue it. My graduate student's kind of happy here. She's not happy that we had to pull trees. We're happy that we're implementing plant disease control. We're getting rid of these virus infected trees so they don't spread to other production areas, to the newer plantings that are going in. And this is going on all throughout the Pacific Northwest as they grapple with these various viruses uh, that they have. Really, there's no other tactics once a plant gets the virus that's going to eventually cause trouble. The best method of control is to prevent getting the virus in the first place. Plant certified virus-free trees or virus-free plants, that is the cat's meow. That's what will get 
you away from all these different viruses and hopefully the plants that you get uh, won't have those particular viruses. If you see viruses on plants you're about to buy, you go to somewhere else. Hmm. Uh, you can do vector control. We did talk about how they move from plant to plant, be they mealybugs or leaf hoppers or nematodes, but these are more commercial oriented uh, tactics, not so much uh, in the backyard. I wanted to try to give you a, a more of a backyard example. Suppose this person that's uh, uh, working with these irises has done a clump that had a virus that could be transferred via uh, a cutting knife or pruners, as you see in this case, and now they've come to a healthy group of irises and now they're cutting through those, they could potentially transmit the virus. And so we would want to sanitize or clean those pruners before we would go from clump to clump uh, in this particular case. I think everybody these days is totally in line with sanitation for virus control. It's what we're all doing all the time, washing your hands, wiping down surfaces, you name it. These are different commercial examples here. Everything you're using, the isopropyl alcohol, all those sorts of things will control plant viruses as well as people viruses uh, as well. And so, uh, there's a couple of things I want you to remember uh, with these things. There's two things that, that it will work well. And so I use this pruners example. I usually use two pruners, tell people to use uh, two of them there. And so uh, be it a cutting knife or a pruners or a hedger shears like this, have one sitting in your disinfectant. The first thing that you want to remember is you want it to be clean. So clean your tools making sure they're nice and clean, get all those plant juices, anything that's stuck on there, get them nice and clean. That's step one. Step two, soak them in the disinfectant here. Soak, not dip. Dipping is for policemen and their donuts, okay? You don't do any dipping. We wanna soak them in there. Depending on the type of material you use, the contact time, the temperature, the type of organisms that you're trying to kill, don't worry about it. There's, there's all, it's all sorts of differences. You look up all the tables. You just want to make sure that you have a long contact time. Put it in there and, that, and then take your other pruners that's nice and clean and, and sanitized and prune a hedge. Cut through a, a group of irises, whatever it happens to be, finish a row, finish a tree, and then with this one that you've been using, take it, put it in there, soak it, pull the other one out that's been soaking, it's probably been in there for a few minutes, no problem, or maybe an hour, who knows. Uh, that's fine. You'll do just fine using that and you won't be transferring viruses from one plant to another. Well, with that, I'm sure plant diseases might be giving you a little bit of a headache. Maybe the COVID virus is giving you a headache uh, as well. I'm going to shut down my share screen here and see if we have any questions that might have developed out there. I see seven in the chat box. Alan, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, you can kind of help me go through some of these things? Okay. Uh, let's see. Everybody can see it. Uh, somebody wants to go back to school. Okay, very good. <laughs> you know, this is the way they're doing school these days, unfortunately. Um, ah, the photo with the no control and the milk. Uh, uh, yes, uh, there was some uh, work done a few years ago. Uh, it was uh, kind of, uh, you saw that during the song right? The tobacco mosaic song. Uh, and there was a uh, picture of uh, some short tobaccos with no, th and then taller tobaccos uh, that had controlled tobacco mosaic virus by using uh, milk. What they had done is they had used milk, milk uh, with its uh, uh, various properties in there can denature uh, viruses. And in particular, tobacco mosaic virus is one uh, that it could denature quite well. It, when you're washing your hands and you use soap, it denatures that, that virus that I showed you, that, that spiraled RNA with the proteins around. Those proteins fall apart and the whole thing just falls apart and it doesn't work. So what they did is they used uh, milk in that particular case. Uh, and I've seen uh, different ways. Uh, I can't remember uh, if skim milk works. Uh, it may not. It certainly is not going to work for all viruses. Uh, it just worked in this particular case. I would not be going out and putting milk on your plants. Uh, then we have to worry about 
uh, human born diseases and we don't really want to worry about that. So anyway, so that's the explanation uh, for that one. You can, uh, if I didn't answer it correctly or if you or not correctly, if I didn't answer it well enough for you, you can uh, put that on chat. Uh, let's see what the other one I'm reading through here. Can the blueberry virus eventually cycle through again? And do we know how many plants fight off the virus or keep it at bay? You know, in that half acre, there were only about two or three plants that never uh, came down with uh, symptoms of the virus that we saw. It may have come down with it before and we didn't uh, pick up on it, uh, but the data, that's what the data is. Only one or two um, became reinfected uh, with the virus. So that did happen, we did see that. Uh, but only one or two out of that entire half acre uh, planting uh, came down with it a, a, a second time and showed that. But it recovered the next year. Uh, the planting looks quite nice right now. Uh, it's not a problem. Do we know how many plants fight off the virus or keep it at bay? Uh, well, it, just those couple uh, really uh, overall. It, it, it's sort of a wave. We had to put up with this virus as it waved through that entire blueberry planting. Okay. I have a question, Jay. Uh, yeah. Those plants that, uh, those blueberries that did fight off the virus and recover yes. uh, back to productive plants, are those plants in the future potentially uh, infective? No, they, are, they are now. Every plant that recovered got the virus, showed the shock reactions, recovered, but still contain the virus, they're still spreading it around in their pollen. Yeah, it's a major problem. They don't have it back east. Uh, they found one plant with it in a planting in a, a University of Michigan uh, a planting. They took the whole planting out. They didn't want to deal with it. They just got rid of the whole thing. Uh, the, you really don't want them in there. They do not pre-infect the plants in the nursery and then send it to you so you won't ever see it. That, that doesn't work too well. And they can't sell their plants to like Canada or uh, back east or uh, to Europe or places like that. They want to be virus free and hopefully you'll never see that. Uh, and then the last one here, how long is long contact time for soaking the tools in the bucket? That's a good question. Uh, and are there certain blueberry species that are more vulnerable to the virus or uh, shock? Um, in the handbook, there are tables of blueberry cultivars and their reactions to various plant diseases, including shock and scorch virus. And you could look that up uh, in there. I don't remember all the different ones. I had Berkeley and I had Bluetta, both very susceptible to that shock virus. Huh, long contact times for soaking. I just don't want you to dip it in, dip it out, pull it out and think it's sanitized. That won't work. Usually we're talking about 15 to 30 seconds for the right temperature of the right material for uh, something like boxwood blight, which is a fungal disease. Uh, we're talking about uh, 15 to 30 seconds in isopropyl alcohol. Other disinfectants will kill the fungus but the contact time rises to several minutes. People wanted it to go fast. I don't want you to worry about it at all. Just leave it in there and soak. I don't care what you're using. Uh, there's all kinds of different things you can use. Well, watch out for bleach. Bleach is a great oxidizer and it'll oxidize your tools too uh, if you don't clean them off and oil them up uh, afterwards. So watch out for that. Uh, but just put them into the uh, bucket for minutes and I think you will, uh, do the, the, the kill on those particular tools uh, with no problem at all. Just no dipping. Uh, we have another question here that just popped up. How do you destroy the plant material to kill off the virus? Well, burn it. That's what they're doing with those cherry uh, trees, those cherry piles that you saw. They're just gonna burn those uh, at some point. You can send it to the landfill. They'll bury it for you can burn it in the backyard, although they're not allowing backyard burning right at the moment, uh, if you call the burn line. Uh, if you wanna compost it, you might be able to do that if it's a, a, a oh, what do I wanna say, an annual plant, a perennial plant, you probably wanna be uh, burning. Excuse me. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, 
I've noticed uh, a mosaic virus on uh, one of my apple trees um, that only seems to affect certain branches. And I'm wondering, are these viruses in fact systemic and the symptoms only show on specific branches? Or is the infection only in those branches and maybe I could get rid of the virus by pruning off those particular branches? Yeah, apple mosaic virus, we've seen a lot of that uh, in our uh, plantings as well, just across the river from uh, Corvallis. And I've seen more uh, every year as, uh, as the time goes on. I'd say I've got about two dozen plants out of a, a one and a half acres. Uh, and it, it started maybe 10, 15 years ago. So it's very slow movement on that. Yeah, one branch here, maybe another branch there. If you cut that branch off, am I not going to see it? The problem is the virus is very unevenly distributed through the tree. You won't get away from it. That's what I'll let, remember that uh, cherry tree picture I showed you where they lopped off all those uh, limbs and then they let some little ones grow up. Yeah, that tree is infected and we just really need to get rid of the entire tree. So if you don't like the apple mosaic, one pruning cut will do the job, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> The chainsaw kind of pruning cut, huh? Yeah, for it, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it'll still produce apples for you. I think you could live with it for, for a number of years yet. And that's, uh, you know, that's up to each individual as to how uh, tolerant you want to be of these various virus problems that get onto your plants. Okay, a couple new ones have come in. Okay, uh, does hot composting destroy viruses? Uh, it will with... Uh, when you're hot composting and you're grinding the material up, you get that temperature up uh, and, and you aerate it and you move, move it around. Yeah, you're going to destroy viruses that might be contained in that plant material. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about that as long as you're composting correctly. If it's just a cold pile, yeah, TMV might, might survive in something like that. Um, do viruses become endemic in the soil in a planting? Uh, really depends on the virus. So I showed you the dagger nematode that can transmit viruses. And yes, that cherry, those cherry orchards, they pulled the cherry orchard out and they still had dagger nematodes there that had the plant virus. And they planted new cherries in there. Those nematodes could transmit the virus uh, over. So um, it is possible. The real problem with all of the questions, of course, is the devil is in the details. And that's where you would go to the handbook and actually look up a little bit more about each of these virus problems uh, and try to decide whether it's something we need to take action on or, or just leave alone. You've mentioned uh, that uh, the main strategy is to find certified virus-free stock. Um, how do you come up with that new stock? Oh, that's a long process. Uh, a lot of times uh, what they do is they have a mother block, they call it, where they're going to take their scions or their uh, root, collect their rootstocks or, or collect their new plants from. Those plants are tested heavily for uh, viruses, uh, they, uh, for, for known vi all the different known, known viruses that could cause them problems. Uh, and when they do find one, yeah, it's gone uh, very quickly. How does, how, did that, how does that nursery get a mother plant that's free of the virus? Well, there are some foundation programs that can produce uh, in, with different tactics virus-free plants. Sometimes all you do is you take that very tip, that meristematic tip, and you put it on culture media and you culture that plant up. Uh, it takes a long time. It takes a lot of uh, rigor to go through that. But that foundational plant material then is distributed to nurseries. They then protect that plant as best they can as they take uh, cuttings off of that and produce plants for us. Does that kind of answer your question? <laughs> it does. Thank you. Okay. Uh, wow. Virus symptoms so diverse. How do you diagnose a specific virus <laughs> as the problem? Well, welcome to virology in the 21st century. Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, you saw with those cherry, how many cherry viruses there were. Turns out that cherry leaf roll virus that we found uh, by itself, it's not too bad on a plant, but when it's in combination with two other viruses, that's when it really causes problems. The other two viruses are very common, 
and they're transmitted via pollen. And so they're usually in the industry already. So when that new virus comes along, yeah, it can be a problem. So virology right now, a uh, plant virology, I should say, is beginning to understand uh, how many viruses it takes to get the kind of symptoms. And usually multiple viruses will give you more severe symptoms. And they're doing different kinds of testing rather than testing for one specific virus. Now they're doing a, what they call a multiplex, looking for as many viruses as they possibly can and trying to understand that. And it's really the cutting edge of plant virology today is understanding how many viruses are there and what symptoms they are producing. And you have to understand it becomes a horrible factorial, you know, to infect a plant with one and then two and then three and then three in different combinations of two. And if you have two dozen different viruses and how many combinations can you, yeah, it gets crazy very quickly. I'm not sure I answered that question very well, but yeah, it's tough. How do you test for viruses? Same way we test for human viruses. Uh, there's a number of different ways to do that. Uh, there are serological techniques. So serology indicating blood, so antibodies. So you'll get an animal like a rabbit that will produce, you, you inject it with the virus. It will then make antibodies to that. And then you harvest the antibodies from that and you create a test so that when you introduce the virus from uh, plant sap, uh, it will react to that uh, and you'll be able to detect the virus that way. So that's a serological technique. There are, um, I showed you the, the pinwheels and things like that, that might, you might, that's a morphological way of doing it. I'm using big words, oh my gosh, uh, uh, just, you can see something. Uh, and then there are molecular tools and the molecular tools are actually looking for the DNA or the RNA that the virus contains. And they're actually looking for those little snippets that are in there. And there's different ways to look for that, uh, but they know the sequence of the bases in that DNA or that RNA, and they'll look for those sequences uh, as they go through that. It takes time to go through that. And those are the various ways that they are looking for not only plant viruses, but uh, COVID-19 as well. Uh, from the perspective of the plant desk, what is our role in getting something to you or telling the client is, is uh, doesn't need to be treated and not to worry about, uh, say, whatever virus it might be. Uh, it, well, the di you got to go through the diagnostic process, okay? And then at some point you figure out what it is. Maybe you can't figure out what it is, so you send it into the plant clinic. Plant clinic tells you what virus they have or have not found. And then they have the information for you to uh, relay to uh, the client. And then it's up to the client to decide what they want to do uh, about that particular uh, plant that they have. Usually they're just curious, hey, what's this going on here? It's so mu not so much on the uh, control because for plant viruses, you, we don't got a lot of controls. Yeah, pull your plant, get rid of it. Which, which could be good for a lot of hobbyists, you know, because they've got their garden totally chucked full of every square inch has a plant. Well, now they can get a new plant. Ooh. It can be exciting. <laughs> I've, I've seen it many times. <laughs> well, it seems to be almost eight o'clock and the questions are kind of petering out there, Ellen. That's what it looks like. Well, so Jay, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. We didn't go to sleep. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> um, and uh, Elizabeth uh, just added a note about the OSU plant clinic, which people can read. Um, there's uh, this is sort of the final authority. Uh, I don't know where the clinic is now that uh, Cordley Hall is being remodeled, but uh, Anyway, there, there are experts that uh, Brooke can take samples to if, if we run out of things. Oh my goodness, what is going on? <laughs> I thought I'd just fly away, sorry. <laughs> oh. Jay, thank you very much. It was a wonderful talk. Happy Halloween to you. Happy Halloween to all you as well.